Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hope you're doing fantastic. Alright, so we are continuing our reading of Mahabin bin Abdul Wahab's Removal of Doubts book. It's been quite nerdy, I must say. We learned quite a lot. And I always enjoy reading things for myself instead of hearing someone else's two minute perspective, right? Because they're going to have their narration of what they feel about a particular individual's methodology and perceptions and all that. And if we don't dig in ourselves, then how will we come to know what we agree with and what we don't, right? So, on that same line, let's continue. Okay, so in this section, he was talking about how people began to exaggerate concerning the righteous. And he goes in about Prophet Noah. I'll share it here with you. This means that Allah sent Nu, may Allah be pleased with him, Noah, to his people when they began to exaggerate concerning the righteous. Indeed, the author dedicated an entire chapter to this issue in his book, Kitab al Tawheed, entitled Chapter Concerning the Reason for the Disbelief of the Progeny of Adam and abandonment of their religion is their excessiveness towards the righteous. So that's Uthman's commentary about what Muhammad Wahab said. Okay. Now he's going to define excessiveness for us. Excessiveness is exceeding the limits as it pertains to worship, action, and commendation whether this is intended in praise of someone or to vilify them and this exaggeration can be divided into four categories so he's going to dig into these categories of what exactly it means to exaggerate the first category excessiveness in creed like the exaggeration of the people of rhetoric ahl al kalam Okay, let's see. Excessiveness in creed concerning the attributes of Allah, which eventually led them to declare Allah's attributes to be like that of creation or deny them completely. Tatil, it says. Okay, so we have the people of rhetoric, which in Arabic is called Ahl al Kalam, and they became excessive in creed. The correct and balanced opinion concerning this affair is the position of Ahl al Sunnah wa al Jama'a, which affirms whatever Allah has affirmed for Himself or whatever His Messenger has affirmed for Him from His names and attributes without distortion, tahrif, denial, tatil, or Explanation as to how they are, takiyif, or offering examples, tamtil. Now, the offering examples part is hard for people like me who think in terms of metaphors, who, you know, our brains work with examples. But what he's getting at, I think, is a different angle because if you're going to compare with examples, with something created, you're comparing a lot of the created. So I understand, but it makes speech a little bit difficult sometimes for us. Now, I tend to like this approach of the Ahl Sunnah wa al Jama'a, where we affirm whatever Allah affirmed for Himself, or what the Prophet, peace be upon Him, said, and then you restrict it to that category, right? not making up your own names and attributes for God. Quite helpful to remember that because sometimes we can forget ourselves. Okay, the second category is excessiveness in worship like the extreme of the Hawarij who consider anyone who commits a major sin to be a disbeliever. Oh, that's what that is. Okay. I myself as a revert have heard this term Hawarij thrown around a lot. Don't exactly know what it meant entirely, I heard different things, but here 
it's interesting because it talks about major sin. So if you do this major sin, you're, people will do talk fear on you. So I guess if somebody is, if someone's calling another person a hawadage, and they're calling someone out, and people perceive this to be a bit unjust to claim them a disbeliever over a sin that they can repent for because the law is the acceptor of repentance. You know, you had to watch out for that. Highly educational. Look at that. We're just learning. That's why I love this book. Similarly, the excessiveness of the mutazila, which led them to declare that the person who commits a major sin has left the station of Iman, but has not yet entered into disbelief. So he is in a station between that of belief and disbelief. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Ah, that's interesting. So one claims you're in, in the middle, not fully out, not fully in. The other says you're fully out. So it all stems around these major sins, if you notice. So let's put a note about that. This type of extremism oppose the exaggerated leniency of the Murjiah. Okay, so exaggerated leniency. That's a cool way of phrasing it. Because it, if you're letting them be in the middle after they've committed a major sin, it makes you see like, huh, which way do you go? So one is people just kick people out very easy. The other seems to be more of a fence sitter, maybe, who claim that sinning does not harm one's faith as long as a person possesses iman. Wow, see, that's so concise. Wow, so the Murjia claim that sinning doesn't harm your faith if you possess iman. But I think all of us, hopefully, will think. Well, sinning is the chipping away of your faith. Because the more you sin, the more you indulge. And the more that indulgence can take over your capacity to resist such sins, which earn the wrath of Allah and don't incur His favor. And Allah can kick you off the straight path and make you lose your iman by hardening your heart. The correct opinion concerning this affair is the position of Aho Asuna wa al Jama'a, which states that the one who commits a sin is deficient in his iman according to the greatness of the sin which he committed. That seems more practical to me, right? So you're deficient in your faith, and then that will correlate to the degree of the said sin. Very good point. So the that's a good point. Because the stronger in faith that you are Unless you'll avoid certain types of sins, and especially major sins. Because the fear of Allah is within you. And you will, inshallah, watch out for that. The third category. Excessiveness in one's transactions. Which is exemplified in a person's harshness and prohibiting everything. Wow. Excessiveness in transactions. So, harshness and prohibiting everything. This type of harshness is opposed by the exaggerated leniency of those who state that everything is lawful that improves the economy and profit even if it is acquired by way of usury, riba, deception, gish, or other than that. Okay. Okay. So the means to the end argument. You notice that? So I feel like he's saying here, just because it's profitable doesn't mean that it's lawful. And just because it improves the economy doesn't mean it's lawful. So he's mentioning the banking system is highly important here for us. Deception, you know, watch out for that too. The correct position in this affair is to say that every transaction which is based upon fair dealing and equity is lawful so long as it agrees with the book and the Sunnah. Okay. So, there you go. So if you're going to enter into some type of transaction, you need to be fair. You need to have equity. And if it does agree with the Sunnah, 
and the Quran, it is lawful. There you go. He has a very concise way of putting this for us, which I tend to enjoy. The fourth and final category for us is excessiveness concerning customs, which is to cling onto old customs while avoiding any progression towards that which is better than it. If the custom contains an equal amount of benefit, then it is better for a person to remain upon them instead of embracing foreign customs. Very unique. Very unique. Wow. So, essentially, he got into exaggeration. And exaggeration, he said, is it leads to the excess of limit breaking and that'll all evolve around worship, actions, and commendation. And he broke it down into four categories. So remember, excessiveness in creed, like the people of rhetoric, Ahl Kalam. And then there was excessiveness in worship, like the extremism of the Hawadij. And then, and the Mutazila. And then it was this element of exaggerated leniency of the Murijia. Then it was excessiveness in one's transactions. And then excessiveness concerning customs. Very concise. I hope you learned something. I did. And see you next time.